Hey, lovers of photography, you are watching I Love Photography Live. This is Alan Murabayashi broadcasting once again from New York, the home of Photo Shelter World Headquarters. I'm joined as usual on this gloomy Thursday with my co-host, Sarah Jacobs. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Alan. How you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Maybe uh, maybe the folks out there are watching us on youtube.com slash photoshelter so they can see all the pretty photos that we look at and some of the not-so-pretty photos we look at. Or maybe you're listening to the podcast by searching for I Love Photography on iTunes, whatever the case is. Welcome. And as usual, a lot to talk about. Um, first of all, hey, Sarah, I'm happy to be back in the United States of America. I know. Me, us too. How was your How was your trip to Japan? <laughs> My trip to Japan was fantastic. Uh, ate a lot of great seafood, and then went over to Taiwan and ate a lot of great uh, food there as well. It's just you know, it's like travel and eating. That's what I like to do. That's all I saw of you. Your Instagram was soft surf. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I took about uh, like 1,900 photos, which you know I might have gotten maybe 10 good ones out of that. You know, but that's, that's good enough for me. It is. That's that's good. <laughs> Because I love photography. Well, we just finished a pretty interesting and informative uh, webinar on copyright for photographers. We were talking to uh, Bill Kramer from w Wonderful Machine and Christine Sue from the Artists Alliance. I always forget the name of that thing. Artists Alliance for Artists' Rights and, and whatnot. Uh, and so transitioning from that copyright stuff, let's go into a copyright uh, piece that we found. And that was on the New Yorker, and it's actually with a very, very uh, well-known photojournalist, Yoongi Kim, who shoots for Contact. Yoongi, uh, you know, I was thinking about this. I refer to her as an old-school photographer, not because she's actually old, but because I think that if you made your mark during the film era, then in that sense, you're old school. Because yeah. you've been shooting for more than 15 years, so you're old school. Yeah, I'd say at this point, that's a fair label. Right, and yeah. she's been everywhere. She's been to Kosovo. She's been to Africa, and you know she's like a she's this Korean woman. So in a lot of these places, she sticks out, uh, but she just puts her nose down and she does her work. Um, talks about one of her passions, which is photographer rights and photographer copyright. Um, and I just thought it was interesting that the, the the thing that stuck out for me was actually one of the quotes at the end, where and and maybe I can find it. Um, is, it, is it about her setting the price of her work and not the infringers? There's that, and also just how she doesn't really want to participate in in sort of this like, the liking generation. Like that's uh, her motivation isn't to get likes. Her motivation, uh, you know, in the past was great good work, and now she's she's putting together a a book, a retrospective of her work. Um, and I thought that's interesting. And and I don't think she's saying that you can't. Uh, take part in the like generation. I think what she's saying is that you you make a choice. You make a choice to be motivated by the likes or you don't. And it's it's not that one is better than the other, it's just that's her choice. And she's she's all for like preserving copyright. She doesn't want her images kind of freely distributed through this sort of viral social media and whatnot, so she has limited participation in social media. And she's protecting her work because she has unique stuff from film. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like to her, money means more than likes. <laughs> like, much more. <laughs> well, as it should. I, as I mean, it I should, she's yeah. a working photographer. She's not a hobbyist photographer. Right. Yeah, exactly. But it's a good read over on the, uh, on the New Yorker. And all of the links that we talk about today will be available on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com in case you're listening to the podcast and you want to see what the heck we're talking about. <laughs> Um, over in Nepal, there is a bunch of guys, and their profession is Sherpa, and actually their names are Sherpa as well, um, and these guys help a lot of Westerners uh, climb up high mountains like the Himalayas and Mount Everest and, and whatnot. And uh, just recently, there was a really, really bad uh, storm and a lot of people lost their lives, including a lot of these Sherpas. Um, and so here's a piece by Aaron Huey over on the National Geographic uh, website. Aaron uh, is a prolific kind of adventure photographer, great, great photographer, uh, and doing a piece on Sherpa pride and sacrifice. Um, 
and you know talking about these guys who you know they're little tiny dudes who carry you know six times they're like ants they carry like six times their weights I'm exaggerating slightly but they their lung capacity is enormous so whereas the westerners come and they're carrying like a little backpack and then take 10 steps and they run out of breath the Sherpas are like carrying all of the equipment for everybody and kind of running up the hill and whatnot and they know the mountain they know how to read the mountain they've had a long lineage of people doing this um, and it was a really poignant set of images that he has here um, especially in light of the fact that a lot of these guys lost their lives and it's a real small community um, yeah I this this uh, particular from Aaron looks a lot different than his other stuff and I actually I had to revisit his site to be like okay what else has this guy done I know I know the rec I recognize the name and I'm more familiar with his uh, his travels across America and those are like these kind of like flashy you know he's using flash it almost feels like a disposable camera and these are just much more I don't know like they're more quiet they're more poignant like they're more intimate yeah yeah I really feel like this new body of work is and I kind of it kind of shifts his whole portfolio. It's really it's nice. Well, and I think that he has a lot of respect for these guys because you know he is an adventure guy. He does go out and and hikes around the Himalayas and the world, and he sees what these guys go through, and he and he and he respects them immensely. And I think therefore he's not trying to create a set of flashy pictures. He's trying to create intimacy with his photos. Mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe not necessarily even for an audience. Maybe really for him, it means a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can tell that there's like a, a very much, he has such respect for these guys, and you can tell that within the pictures, which I think is great. He incidentally also has like 150,000 followers on Instagram. So he's doing very well. <laughs> he's getting the likes. He's, he's getting, getting the likes. likes. He's getting the likes, but he's doing good work. Uh, so again, it's it's neither good nor bad. It's just what it is. Um, speaking of Instagram, over on the New York Times, they have a whole article talking about how uh, your Instagram picture and your Instagram feed and access to your followers is worth a lot and how people are trading or they're bartering essentially services like a helicopter ride as long as you post uh, a couple photos from the helicopter ride and you tag the helicopter company um, so last week I think it was yeah last week or, or two weeks ago when we talked about uh, the article that Suzanne Cease wrote on a photo editor about social media and licensing of images and what that's worth we didn't really talk about this whole aspect. That was, you know, we, we, we talked about focusing on, well, what is it worth for likes when you have a large uh, following? Mm -hmm. um, or the, the, the brands paying, like what yeah, exactly. exactly what they're paying the photographers, right? And, and this was interesting because they brought up, they brought up the Mercedes-Benz campaign, which we've heard a lot. Mercedes has been very aggressive uh, with their CLA model, which is a lower price model, and they're trying to get away from the sort of you know, grandpa image that Mercedes uh, has had in the past by appealing to a younger set. So Instagram is a perfect way to, to get to the, the 20s and 30-somethings. Um, but they also mention a lot of, like, smaller niche brands, like the helicopter mm -hmm. people. Um, so it's interesting to see these smaller brands recognizing uh, the value that Instagram has. And I think it was the last example that they gave where the person only had, like, a 1,000 followers, but there were, like, a 1,000 really good followers. It was exactly the, dem you know, like, affluent, demographic, um, trendsetters, etc. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, they thought it was a perfect investment. Yeah, yeah. So, and even even editorial sites are, it's, you know, it's not just big brands like Mercedes. Editorial sites like Refinery29 are hosting Insta meetups where they basically create a very photographic event and then invite a bunch of popular Instagrammers and have them just kind of have some fun and take pictures and say, you know, I'm at the Refinery29 headquarters Insta meetup. And you know what? If I'm if I'm strictly an Instagram photographer, that probably makes me feel pretty good. Oh, I got yeah. invited to the Refinery29 thing. Yeah. And I got like some free swag and I bartered a couple things and, and I'm good to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, but I barter's a real part of the economy. Yeah. I know. they And they get some pictures for their portfolio out of it. It's like, that's fun. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've got a thousand followers. Well, do I, you? I almost have nine hundred followers. So if anybody wants to barter with me, <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm trying to think of what type of service. I'll take a helicopter ride. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, nobody's gonna. Nobody's gonna. I should just keep my mouth shut, Probably which is not. a perfect transition to talk about Carmelite nuns. <laughs> Let's talk about some nuns. <laughs> Who keep their mouth shut. They never talk. You know, when I was in college, we told this joke about Carmelite nuns, and I, I've been trying to remember it, and I just can't remember it, but it was something about how, you know, uh, the nun the, the, the nun went to the mom, nun, and, and she said, you've, you've done nothing, you've said nothing since you've gotten here. So I'm like, yeah, oh, whatever. It was funny. It was funny at the time. But this is a poignant set of photos of nuns, of Carmelite nuns, and Carmelites swear to silence. So if you're one of those yoga people or meditation people who go to these retreats where you're not allowed to talk and it lasts for a couple, like a week, and you're like, whew, I'm glad that's done. <laughs> Try not talking for your whole life. Oh, man. Nope. <laughs> so Ebola Fair took these images, and you know what? They're like really nice images. They're beautiful. They're, they're like medium format. That they have this really, you know, that 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 separation of foreground and background that I love from large format and medium format, and just really poignant set of images. Yeah, I mean, I I just I want to say that they're quiet because they actually are. <laughs> they are. <laughs> uh, and I want to say they speak for themselves, but they don't speak at all. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, these are these are really beautiful. They and some of them though do have this kind of eerie quality to them because this is such a life that you know a lot of people don't know about and don't experience and so they kind of have this weird eerie a lot of white in the pictures mm -hmm. lots of like white linens and and white rooms and a little bit creepy this one is a little creepy her looking mm -hmm. off into the distance yeah. yeah but you know so effective like such an effective set of portraits um, yeah and makes you just want to go out and try to shoot portraits with natural light like window light this is perfect window light yeah absolutely you know and I mean I don't know when she shot these photos but look at this old school computer with the huge <laughs> TV. You know, it's probably one running like Windows 98 or something and they don't care no they don't no. care what are they going to complain I mean I guess they could write an email but they're not going to shout and yell about it <laughs> enough with the puns about the okay. nuns who don't speak no puns really, about the nuns. Yeah. We love on. these uh, images by Ebola Fair. This was a really interesting set of images over on Slate. And the title is The Decadence and Environmental Destruction of American Expansionism in Nevada, and Nevada specifically, um, and around the Las Vegas area specifically, because uh, as you may or may not know, Las Vegas at one point, uh, in the past decade or so, had a real boom uh, uh, season or a set of seasons, and people were building all of these houses and golf courses and using up all the water in that that desert. Yes, it's a desert, and pumping it from Lake Mead. And if you ever been to Lake Mead recently, you know how much it's uh, how the how the water levels have really really declined. But you look at these images and you remember that they're in the desert. And you see these subdivisions with these manicured lawns and all this green and all of this development in an otherwise beautiful desert. And you just have to agree, like, this is environmental destruction for what? And a lot of these places are uninhabited and people went bankrupt in all, right. all these huge houses. Because, yeah, he started sh shooting the series in 2008, right, when the economy tanked. Um, but a, a great example... Of, of photography bringing to light this sort of social economic issue. And I remember seeing Vincent LaFerre back in the day when he actually shot photos, not making films and, and teaching uh, workshops. Uh, he did a whole set um, of aerial photos in Las Vegas as well. And he was shocked to find, and, and I'm probably making up the number, but I'm not far off, that something like 90% of the water utilization in Las Vegas goes to golf courses. Oh, yeah. It's yep. ridiculous. Yeah, it is ridiculous. Got to keep them green. Got to keep them green because people, you know, are going for this fantasy land thing. But it, it really is a shocking set of images. Um, and, and really well, well done. I like the time of day. I like the angle that he's using. Um, just really, like, 
too bad Google Maps doesn't look like this. Oh, yeah, wow. Well, you know what I mean? It will one day. I don't doubt it. It will one day. Uh, we release a set of grades for photography contests every year, and one of the top ones, one of my favorites is the Nikon Small World Contest and the reason why is because it's an, an, a niche focus that has a great set of prizes and it gets a lot of press coverage. For whatever reason, well, I, it's not it's really, really cool to see when you get these close-ups of bugs and plants and cells and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the final judging is almost complete and so here are some of the finalists and as usual some pretty spectacular images. Some of these images, because they're so small, are artificially colored because there's no color when things get that small. Um, but they're beautiful images. Now, I don't know how you feel about science images, but I like I like these images. I think they're kind of cool, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. Wait, now I have a question about the color. You might yeah. know, maybe not. But I mean, if they're if they're doing color in post, I mean, how are they guessing what color this stuff is? They're just they're, making they're it not, there, there literally is no color because the, the wavelength of light gets so short that it's out of our spectrum of what we see color. So they're just adding color in order to make the contrast uh, better and more appealing so you can identify different structures. Oh, yep, okay. Um, so like in this image right here, I yeah, see. exactly. Those little red eye things, you know, yeah. that's some part of the organelle and that's how we identify it. Oh, wow. With that false color. Um, but kind of neat. Like a macro lens to the max. To the max, yes. This so, feels like under a microscope. Yeah. I was looking at these images, uh, and, and I was researching for the photo contest guide, and then I came across this contest, which I had never heard of. Uh-oh. You got to add it now. I got to add it. Yeah, I was thinking about adding it. Maybe next year. Uh, this is the Society of Biologies third annual photography contest. Society of Biology. There's a society for everything. <laughs> now, I didn't, I didn't uniformly like all of these images, nor should anyone. I mean, you, you're not obligated to like these images, but this image, is I, uh, this image I like. Bison's on the Grand Prismatic Spring. That color is pretty incredible. The color's incredible, and you see these little bison, the figures, the brown figures against that. Again, I don't know whether he was up on a mountain or in a helicopter or he was using a drone. And that's a pretty nice photo. Yeah. It's cool, though, too, that the uh, the Society of Biology is celebrating photography, starting to do that. You know, it's just the third year. But it's, it's cool that they're doing that. Well, and you know what? I think that's a very, very good point because uh, another one is the California... Uh, it's called the Big Picture Contest for the California's... Uh, sciences organization. Again, I'm butchering all these names, but they had their inaugural photo contest as well. Mm. Um, and I think people are, are starting to realize or re-realizing the value of photography and how it can be uh, virally spread and how photos really can, can bring focus onto uh, a subject matter. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like this, this particular image doesn't do anything for me compared to the bison, but, you know, it's interesting to see these different biological processes. I mean, this is beautiful light, the, the spider. They probably bumped the saturation up a little bit on that, but, but the, <laughs> the light's really nice. Look at that spider web. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Yeah. After, after learning that they, some people in post put color in there, it's not even that, that's, that's fine for if they the microscop it. microscopic <laughs> images. Uh, I know, I know. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> we switch over to wired.com for a set of images uh, from an embedded photographer with the US Marshals and this is uh, Brian Finke. And it might be Fink. I know his name, I just don't know how to pronounce it. It might be Fink, but I'm I think it's Fink. Okay, I'm going to go with Fink then. All right, yeah. Well, he uh, had a buddy uh, who put him in touch with the U.S. Marshals, which turned out to be the oldest law enforcement organization in the U.S. They were founded in 1798. Wow. 1798 for the purposes of uh, transporting fugitives uh, and whatnot. But he got in here and he was embedded. And you look at these photos and you're like, wow, they're, they're really well lit for for being like an embed in these dangerous situations. <laughs> and as it turns out, he traveled with an assistant 
and they used uh, quantum Q flashes. And quantum Q flashes, uh, if you've ever had a quantum battery that hooks into your, your flash to power it so it cycles very, very quickly, quantum makes a big flash that's a 400 watt second flash. And so they had two of them. So the assistant would run into the corner or whatever and Brian would have one and they would shoot these images. Um, and so you have these very, very dramatically lit photos. I love, he, this is kind of his signature look to yeah. have that that bright poppy flash. And yeah. I love that he's brought it to this U.S. Marshall project because it's just, this is not how you would usually think of U.S. Marshalls in right. this sort of like quirky light. But Brian always creates these very like clean images and everything is sort of perfect within his world, even if what you're seeing is not perfect. And I just, I love that about his work. It's like, I want to live in a Brian photograph. <laughs> yeah, and you look at this image, like, look how hard the shadow is from the sun. You know, yeah. It's probably four in the afternoon, a long, long shadow, and yet they're perfectly lit from the back because they're just popping so much light into the back of these guys. Right. Uh, but to your point, yeah, they're so well composed. Mm -hmm. These graphic lines, strong mm -hmm. lines, good exposure. This is a beautiful photo. Yeah, that is, that's gorgeous. Um, they, they look like... Uh, advertisements for the U.S. Marshal Service mm, rather yeah. than documentary photos. Yeah. yeah. And I love this guy. They're like, why is this guy wearing a bow tie? It was bow tie Monday. <laughs> for, I think it was in Los Angeles. <laughs> for the for U.S. Marshal yeah. yeah. Everybody should have a dress-up day. You remember uh, we had a blazer day at the office oh, yeah. years ago when you started. Like two years ago, that's right. <laughs> Good old blazer day at the photo shelter office. Let's bring that back. Let's bring it back. Here's an article on the New York Times, uh, and it is for the health issue in the New York Times magazine. And what an interesting article it was, by the way. And it's called, What if Age is Nothing but a Mindset? First, let me tell you about the article, and then we can look at the, the photos. The article talks about a Harvard psychologist, I think it is. And her area of research is kind of into mind-body connection. And back in the 80s, she took a bunch of old dudes, I think they were in their 80s, like six of them, and she brought them into this house, and the house had no mirrors or anything, and she made them dress up as if they were much younger, and she had uh, photos and clothing and everything from an era when they were much younger, and after a few days or a week of them being in this environment, they came out, and the guy that was in a wheelchair was walking with a cane, and everyone's energy levels were higher, and everybody looked younger, so <laughs> it's this whole thing about, okay, well, if you think younger then you actually act younger and you are younger um, and so that's the whole premise of the article and there's obviously you know people who are criticizing this theory and people who are supportive of it and excited about it but here are the set of images which are uh, photo illustrations by Zachary Scott and they're so great and Amy Dresser who spoke at our Luminance con uh, conference two years ago uh, was hired to do some of the retouching <laughs> Uh, but look at these, the, the first set of images here, this, this little girl dressed up as the grandma and the little boy dressed up as the grandpa um, <laughs> with just this beautiful light. And when I saw these images, all I could think was, you know, if you had a whole crew of, of prop builders and stylists and wardrobe people and lighting assistants and retouchers and you had a good vision as a photographer... Look at the stuff you can create. What yeah. amazing photos he's out Yeah, I know. I, I, I wanted to see who he worked with on this, and I was very happy to see Amy Dresser's name on it Yeah, because she's, she's great. Um, but, yeah, he had a whole crew with him to do this stuff, and they did foam latex prosthetics on these kids, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. Add this up at the Yeah, office. like this kid, come on. Oh, my gosh. So cute. I mean, so fun. So it's a little, it's a little baby, but he's got like a receding hairline and a and a little mustache. So and See, wearing. I think, a, I think that's cute, but a lot of people at the office that saw it on my screen reacted negatively to these pictures. Really? Which, yes, which I thought was very interesting. They were like, "Oh, this is creepy," and I was like, "No, it's cute." Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it's a little bit creepy. You know, there is that that disease where you age, you know, ten times faster. So that you have these little kids that look like old people, but I don't think that's really the intent. No, yeah. no. What a what a wonderful way to illustrate this article too, and just make it that much more fun to read and interactive. I mean, 
hats off to Zachary. This is great. I'm very curious to see the brief that he received. Yeah. Maybe we can ask Kathy Ryan for the brief or ask Zachary for the brief to see how much latitude he had. Yeah. And whether he participated in the casting and, and whatnot. Yeah. But a cool set of images. Very cool. Very you know, cool. the other thing that we should note is the New York Times and the New York Times Magazine, whenever it's not a documentary-style photo, whenever there's any sort of staging associated with it, they call it a photo illustration nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also in response, like a number of magazines where they've manipulated... You know, the New York Magazine does this where they're compositive stuff. They all call them photo illustrations. So there's no ambiguity over whether this was, quote, real or not. But does that mean, do you know if that still means that they hired that photographer for the specific article or they solicited these images to represent the article? No, I think that they hired him, but they're saying because it wasn't, you know, because the kid doesn't actually look like this. Right. Uh, because it's not a news photo that they call it a photo illustration. Got it, got it. Um, but a great set of images and a really, really interesting article. So check that out. We'll have all the links on blog.photoshelter.com. I was going uh, to Taipei 101, which is the tallest building in Taiwan. And it used to be the tallest building. And it still has the fastest elevators in the world. And I was waiting in line, and I think I was going through my Facebook feed, and I came across this, and all I saw was donut selfie. <laughs> and I rolled my eyes, and I was like, ah, donut selfie, like another sub-genre of selfie, whatever. <laughs> so I passed by it, but then I was like, you know what? I'm kind of curious. I'm kind of into selfies. Uh, I, I really want to know what this donut selfie is about. And so this woman, Karen X. Cheng, came up with this concept and and named it the donut selfie, which I think in and of itself, just because she named it it, it, it felt a little fake. But it's kind of cool. So I'm going to show you a little bit of it. Uh, I would encourage you to actually watch it on YouTube because obviously it's going to be a little herky-jerky um, while you watch it on the broadcast. But what she does is she takes her phone and she uses the slow-mo function on her phone and then she just kind of rotates the phone phone around her head and then for the transition she slams it into her ear so it gets dark and then she uses that as the transition into the next scene. So she's going from place to place using this technique. She's in front of a train, she's in her bedroom, she's in a restaurant, she's in dance class. So you go through this and for a few seconds you're like okay but then now she's at her birthday and then she's in a cathedral and so the total effect is actually very very cool. Yeah, this is totally up your alley, Alan. I just totally up my Yeah, alley. and also I, I applaud her for using a great song for this. It fits perfectly. <laughs> she used Daft Punk's Around the World to uh -huh. do her donut selfie, which I thought was phenomenal. So hats off to you, Karen. <laughs> and she has a tutorial on how to do a donut selfie, which I actually didn't watch because I think I can probably figure it out myself. <laughs> she, but she's not trying to keep it a secret. Which is nice. No, she's open sourcing that thing. She's sharing it with the world. Yeah. Uh, we've had the, the, the broadcast now for, I think this is our 36th episode, and it, probably every other episode, Sarah, I say, oh, i got to try that. I know. Um, and there's not actually, you know, I've said that a lot, and I haven't actually tried a lot of this stuff. And when I was in Jackson, Wyoming, for the Rich, Rich Clarkson uh, uh, workshop, I actually said, you know what, i got to start doing some of this stuff. So I pulled out, you know, we talked about the Google Photosphere thing where you can make a 360. It's an yeah. App so yes. I made a couple of those. Cool. Other things. But they're not, you know, I don't really want to share them with the world at large. I just want to let you know that I've been doing them. That's, I'm, our listeners will be very happy to know that. So and happy I'm also to know ha that, right? I'm also happy to know it. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll do a donut selfie for myself and let you know that I did it next week. Cool, but you'd have to show us that because that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know we have a love-hate relationship with humans of New York. Yes, I do. And we've talked about humans of New York a lot, and we, and we talked about that parody uh, set of images that we saw where somebody appropriated all of his images and then wrote fake captions, yeah. which were just hilarious. It was all swear words because I was like, uh, the real New Yorkers of New York or something yes, like that. Yes, like, yes, yes. Why the fuck are you talking to me? You Get away, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, so once again, I'm going through my Facebook feed the other day, 
and I see this particular image, which you're looking at, and it's a it's a, a good-looking kid. He's got glasses on. I don't know how old is he. Like six? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, he's like okay. six or seven. Yeah. And he's being held by his mom. They look really, really happy and wholesome. You know, it's nice white mom and you know beautiful kid with the blonde hair, fashionably dressed in his crew sweater with red jeans. I mean, come on, <laughs> right? Yep, yep. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, ah, da, 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 whatever, another image. But we're going to end on this because we always end on something that's kind of fun and funny. And so I scroll down to the caption. Let's scroll down to the caption. And this is the caption. And it says, this morning he asked me if it was still not allowed to say, what the fuck? <laughs> and that was so great. Aww. Because it kind of blew all the stereotypes that you had about this mom and the kid right out of the water. Like the kid's a little rascal, or maybe he's a little cuckoo. Maybe a little, you know, <laughs> learning disability or something. Whatever the case was, it, it made me laugh. All I, kids, I, I all kids want to say, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, because you're hearing it, it's funny. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Humans of New York constantly breaking stereotypes. No, he, you job. know, as much as I as much as I give him shit, he's out there and he's doing it every day. And he's he is, he is. Stuff and he's doing his own thing. So That's true. Honey, keep doing your thing, Honey. <laughs> well, Sarah, another show back in the back in the USA. So glad. Why don't we do it again next week? Let's do it again. I'll be let's here. Do it again. Okay, let's do it. Uh, hopefully it'll be a little sunny. Oh, you know what next week is? What's next? Oh, it's PPE. Halloween. It's PPE and it's Halloween. Oh my gosh, so much going on. So much going on. Photo Plus Expo. What are what is Photo Shelter doing for Photo Plus Expo? We're gonna have a happy hour. We have a happy hour going on. Yep, in Midtown. I'm blanking on the name of the bar, but that's on Thursday. Yeah, and I think we're walking around the show floor, handing out something or another. Yep, we're gonna be also at PPE. Check the blog for those dates. We have a couple talks that we're doing. We do. We also have talks. Yeah. We have a marketing talk with Andrew, our CEO, and Amy, our director of marketing. And I'm interviewing Joe McNally, one of the great photographers. Oh, that's fabulous. That I'm, that I'm quite excited about. <laughs> I like that guy, Joe. Awesome. Yes, Joe is the best. Very cool. So that, that interview is actually happening on Halloween as well. So we'll figure out where to slide in some Isla photography, or ILP, as we like to call it. Yeah, ILP. 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 I started calling it ILP. Uh. I wish you would have consulted me on that first. Might be too cool for school. It's a little too too much. All right, we'll talk about it offline, and we'll get that straight for next week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so for Sarah Jacobs, this is Alan Murbayashi signing off for another I Love Photography. We'll see you next week. <laughs>